Hi there, this is Jessica from the Healing Hands Duo and today I'm going to be discussing my five tips on how to heal and seal a leaky gut and ulcerative colitis. Diet and exercise is often the two places people turn to first when deciding to make a positive and healthy lifestyle change. I know Kevin did and I know I did as well. Um, and for many of you out there, it is a new year. We're just into 2018, so I'm sure many of you made this year New Year's resolution, um, as well as some of you made New Year's resolutions to hit the gym, you know, build some muscle, uh, lose some weight, whatever the reason it is that you've decided to actually go ahead and make this lifestyle change. For me, I know it was in a sense, I was actually forced into the lifestyle because of my ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, but for many of you, it may just be as simple as something as you are not really able to digest your food, you're having a lot of stomach pain, you're having a lot of diarrhea or constipation or bloating or distension or you're not able to lose weight or any of the above. I wanna take you through first what leaky gut syndrome actually is and then I want to give you five of my tips to actually heal leaky gut and ulcerative colitis. Leaky gut syndrome is a condition in which the small intestine becomes permeable, allowing undigested food particles, toxic waste, bacteria and yeast to enter into the blood system. This often sends the body into panic mode when it realizes that there are invaders in the blood which its natural response is then to attack, sending the body into a state of systemic inflammation. Here are some signs and symptoms that you may be in fact dealing with leaky gut syndrome. Depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Acne, rosacea, eczema, and psoriasis. Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. Constipation, diarrhea, IBS, or IBD. Adrenal fatigue. Rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, headaches. Frequent colds and food sensitivities. Kevin and I suffered with a multitude of these symptoms, which is what led us to our extensive research in the area of diet and nutrition. For years, I had had problems with my stomach. I knew that there was something wrong. Um, probably at a young age, I knew that I wasn't reacting to certain foods very well. I neglected my body and I just continued to eat whatever the heck I wanted to. What led me to want to change my diet to this extent was not only was I extremely horrified and I was confused and I was scared when I found out about my diagnosis. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know if it meant that in the long term I would be struggling with a chronic illness for the rest of my life, which is what I was being told by my doctors. I would be on multiple prescription drugs, immunosuppressants it was a possibility for me, and of course colon surgery or having the bowel removed altogether, which was something that I was not going to even consider. I knew that there must be a better way to fix what had been done and the damage that had been done in my body and I was a firm believer. I didn't know it would be as difficult as it has been for us but that's probably because we have had to go through a bunch of different avenues to get where we are today and that's only because when we first started there wasn't a lot of options for people like us back then nobody knew what gluten sensitivity was there were very many there were very little people that you know classified themselves as lactose intolerant but they didn't really care and they were eating dairy anyway and you know the list just goes on and on however today it's going to be a lot more easy for you to decide to do a diet that's going to heal and seal the gut because there's a lot more options out there for you right now um, in terms of food and what is actually available another reason why some people are unable to digest certain foods is because they lack certain enzymes altogether or they have an insufficient amount of these particular enzymes or their body pH is off and their enzymes are not functioning properly. Enzymes are created in four different areas of the body. One is the salivary glands. So it is so important people to chew, 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 chew your food. Another place that we produce enzymes is actually in our stomach. The other place is our pancreas. The fourth place is in our small intestine. Another thing to consider is that it may not have anything to do with the fact that you are lacking in particular enzymes. But, um, and in this case, when you're talking about the stomach, we have a particular stomach acid that if it is not balanced, which means if it is too high or too low, 
your enzymes will not function as well. And now here are my five tips to consider if you are currently struggling with digestive issues. Number one, stop eating offending foods. However, this one can be difficult to decipher up front because food can take up to three days to be eliminated by the intestines which means you can then present with symptoms for the same amount of time. The only way to figure out what you are reacting to is to perform some type of elimination diet. Another option that is available to you is to see a practitioner who can help you work past those intolerances using something called a BIE machine in conjunction with muscle testing, better known as applied kinesiology. However, if you are determined to do this on your own account and you do not want to see a practitioner, then here are the three diets that I would suggest and this is where we started. Breaking the vicious cycle, the specific carbohydrate diet. This is an amazing book to open your eyes to what you are eating and what real food really means. The body ecology diet, recovering your health and rebuilding your immunity. Another really great book, it actually takes you through the importance of eating and how to prepare fermented and probiotic rich foods. Gut and psychology syndrome, better known as the GAPS diet. So that's another great one to pick up and read today. Another thing I kind of wanted to mention here was that just to give you guys hope, especially if you are somebody that's struggling with IBD or IBS, I did these diets very, very strictly for the first two to three years, but then I was actually able to put a few things in here and there. Of course, I've never been able to go back to the way I used to eat, and to be honest, I don't really want to go back there anyway, but the one other thing that I was so proud about and so proud of myself for being able to do was to be able to wean myself completely off of medication within I'm pretty sure two and a half years so I was at one point taking 12 anti-inflammatories a day so I would have to pop anti-inflammatories throughout the entire day and then I had to actually take two pills of 40 milligrams of Nexium which is a proton pump inhibitor Again, this is not where I'm suggesting you go ahead and start a diet and throw all your prescription away like I did, but it's just something to consider that I was able to bring my gut health back to a place where I wasn't needing them anymore. Which leads me to tip number two. You must consider good quality probiotics and incorporating fermented foods into your daily regimen. There is a common misconception that probiotics on their own are good enough to repopulate the gut with good bacteria. But after working for a large nutraceutical company for nearly eight years, I found that this simply was not the case. Probiotics merely create a good environment in the intestines for good bacteria to grow. However, fermented foods like live cultured sauerkraut is where the real magic happens when trying to re-inoculate your gut. The bacteria counts in just two ounces of fermented foods are so much higher and they usually contain multiple strains of good bacteria than in an entire bottle of probiotics. Which leads me to tip number three. If you decided you don't want to read all those three books because that was just too much literature for you to read and you want to give this a shot anyway, then my first suggestion to you in this case would be to avoid inflammatory foods at all cost. And some of you might be asking, what exactly are inflammatory foods? Processed foods of any kind, especially those that are genetically modified, contain glyphosate or are conventionally grown with pesticides and herbicides. All grains, with maybe the exception of some of the so-called super grains, if you seem to be okay with them. The reason why I mention super grains is that they are in fact seeds and not really grains at all, such as quinoa, millet, or buckwheat. They pack a punch of vitamins and minerals, and they're often gluten-friendly. Sugar, in general, is just not allowed unless it's accompanied by fiber, which means that it needs to come in its original form, which is fruit. You may also be able to get away with eating low levels of honey to sweeten things. Stevie is another one to consider as a sugar substitute, but I'm going to warn you now that it's an acquired taste. 
starchy or nightshade vegetables can really aggravate some with candida overgrowth or a current inflammatory condition such as rheumatoid arthritis. Most dairy products are also off limits and here's why. According to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Overall, about 75% of the world's population, including 25% of those in the U.S., lose their lactase enzymes after weaning. The recognition of this fact has resulted in a very important change in terminology. Those who could not digest milk were once called lactose intolerant or lactase deficient. They are now regarded as normal, while those adults who retain the enzymes allowing them to digest milk are called lactase persistent. There is no reason for people with lactose intolerance to push themselves to drink milk. Indeed, milk does not offer any nutrients that cannot be found in a healthier form in other foods. Surprisingly, milk drinking does not even appear to prevent osteoporosis. Soy-based products. There is a lot of conflicting information out there in regards to whether or not soy products are considered bad or in fact a health food. But in my experience, I have never done well with it, even when it has been fermented. In its raw form, soy is very hard to digest because it contains powerful enzyme inhibitors. The only way to eliminate these enzymes is to either ferment it or process it. In most cases, soy is highly processed. Most healing diets will also encourage you to eliminate it altogether. So here is tip number four. Consume bone broth. What I did when I was healing and sealing my gut is I actually replaced drinking coffee and tea with drinking bone broth. And the reason why I'm suggesting to this to you now is because bone broth has everything that you need to heal and seal a leaky gut. Bone broth contains one of the richest natural concentrations of minerals, collagen, and glutamine, all of which are powerhouses for repairing your gut lining and reducing inflammation. You can either make your own bone broth at home, which is a bit of a process to ensure it's done correctly, or you can usually find bone broth at your local organic supermarket. And here's my tip number five, and one that Kevin and I screwed up for so many years. Don't forget your fats. Fats are so, so important, and here's why. Here are some good fats to consider. Avocados, raw olive oil, sprouted nuts or nut seed butters. Coconut oil is absolutely the only cooking oil that I ever use in my kitchen and the reason why is because it can withstand high heat cooking and will not go rancid. It's also a great antifungal which will help eliminate yeast. Fatty fish is also a huge one on my list of musts. My first choice would be a small cold water fish like sardines or mackerel. I know many people don't care for them. With that said, I would suggest you consume wild-caught trout or salmon because omega-3s are essential for reducing inflammation. Plus, the fats in all of these foods will help to keep you full for a longer period of time since you'll be cutting out all grains and starchy vegetables. If you're concerned about the mercury debate and whether or not to consume fish, on a regular basis like we do, which is about two to three times a week, then you can obviously take fish oils and that would be okay as well. I take what's called krill oil on top of eating fish a couple of times a week for the fat. Um, and the reason why I take krill oil is because it has astaxanthin in it, which is an antioxidant that prevents the actual krill oil from going rancid. It is also an amazing antioxidant to just take on its own. That is my last tip for the day. If you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to our channel. And um, I know on your screen somewhere, I believe it's gonna be in the upper left-hand corner, there is a little bell. So if you actually click that, it'll send you notifications on when I upload my new videos. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.